hear the version of Holy Diver. Um, yeah. I, I certainly didn't expect it. Like uh, everything was was uh, going as it, as it, as it normally would, and then it it took quite a, quite a turn. But I'm not gonna spoil it for the people who haven't listened to the album yet. Uh, but yeah, of course, yeah. uh, uniqueness has always been a strong point of of your guys' albums. But it also seems to be a little polarizing. Um, a lot of people came on board with the uh, Road Salt albums, but also some of your longtime fans found a new approach to composition and production a bit a bit um, disconcerting. Does that ever worry yeah. you when you're uh, working on a new album? It always does. Uh, I try not to worry about it because it doesn't really make any sense. Because I know I'm gonna. I mean, we're doing what we want to do, and we're, and as I said, we're, we're constantly driven by, especially me as a songwriter, I'm very driven by passion and curiosity, and I need to feel passionate about what I'm doing. Uh, and I was so totally tired and sick of what I consider to be bad productions, um, in especially in the, the prog metal scene, with a, a very cold... Uh, a cold, hard wall of sound with clicky bass drums, and uh, it's just a, uh, to me that's just the bottom line of, of bad, bad production. Um, and I wanted to. I, I guess it's in a way it's a statement, but it's also an escape for me, being in this, in this music style, being in this genre, and hearing this all the time on every, every festival I'm playing, every every time I'm I'm, you know, getting confronted with the rest of the bands and the rest of the music in this genre, I get fed up in a way that I don't think you know, the, the typical fans would, would understand. Yeah, because you're around um, that much more, right? Uh, you're, you're living with it, and, and it, it's not like once every few months, like, like the fans where they go and maybe listen to an album or, or go to a show. You have to live that yeah, day yeah. by day, and it's completely different. Yeah, we're, we're there every day, and, and, and you just get to the point where you go like, you're, you're, maybe you're overcompensating in the other direction, but I think that's an important thing to do, and I think that's how many of the, many of my favorite albums have been, you know, I think many of my favorite albums have, have derived from exactly that type of frustration in the people making the, the album. Yeah. Um, that it's it's a reaction towards the the surrounding norms of yeah. that time, and in retrospective, those are usually more timeless and interesting yeah. than all of the the albums that follow the typical norms and yeah. trends. Your words actually remind me of uh, what uh, Michael Ackerfeld said about uh, the release of Heritage a couple of years uh, after you guys released uh, Rose. Well, not not that I'm comparing, but. Um, he also yeah. said that he was he was a bit tired of the uh, cold sound and and the production that uh, direction that the industry was taking and that's why he decided yeah. to record what he recorded you know where where ABBA had recorded and the more uh, uh, organic approach to music production um, yeah. and actually I have a question about about the production of the album because. I've, I've been, I'm actually a, a producer by trade, and I've been scouring, like, looking hard for the inf for technical information about the album because it, it doesn't say anywhere who engineered the album and, you know, who mixed it, who produced it, you know, who mastered it. it the Rose Salt? Yeah. Rose Salt uh, albums? No, no, no. Uh, Falling uh, Home. Falling Home. Uh, Falling Home. Uh, it's, uh, I, I mixed that uh, as well. It's supposed to say, though, in the liner notes, um, in the about I, I don't know if you have received like a full copy or no no I have received... the I have the release from the from the record label but it it doesn't say on, the, right. on the on the liner notes sadly it usually does uh, but okay I, I uh, yeah it was um, we we recorded yeah. ourselves in the rehearsing room uh, just as we did with Floatsoft and and I've mixed it and uh, recorded most of it myself because it sounds absolutely um, fantastic it's it's so organic. Um, and, All right, cool. Thanks. And, and I don't know if if you uh, what what your approach to it was. I don't know if you did it very old school, like with tape, uh, you know, two inch tape for for the master, or, or or what your approach was. But the dynamic range and the the, the organic sound of the album is quite a breath of fresh air for for the industry. 
Oh, I'm really, really happy to hear that. A, the, the thing is, I was uh, I was never trained for like sound engineering or production. Uh, I just like being in studio over and over again. I just knew what kind of sound I wanted, um, and so when I I mean, twelve five was the first album that I mixed myself, and ever since, even though I've mixed so many albums, I still feel really insecure about what I'm doing because yeah. I've, I've, it's like feeling like, Hey, I was not trained for this. Yeah. I, I, I just think I know what I'm doing yeah. right here. Um, but I know what I want to hear. And I, I know when I, you know, it, I guess the, the downside is that it takes much longer for me to get there. Yeah. Um, cause I don't have the routine that a, a typical producer would have and a typical engineer would have. Um, I, I know my way around it, but I, w I will have to sort of like, uh, I have to look things up all the time when I'm sitting there. Um, I've learned the frequencies a lot, you know, because that's just fairly intuitive. It's like a, a palette of taste. Really. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you very quickly learn um, what taste a, a particular frequency is. Um, but apart from that, I mean, like, I, I remember like during uh Scarsic like trying to you know learn how to side chain things that was like uh, I want to do this but how do I do it yeah <laughs> I'd, I'd have to like look so many things up and then it was time for the next album I'd forgotten all about it and it was you know because that's another thing like if someone who works with this they will work with it all the time you know, and, and keep it up for me, it's like I have to start over again the next time, you know, because that's another thing. I don't, I don't want to work with templates in right. a way. I, um, I, I guess I wanted to simulate or emulate the, the 70s approach to, to mixing in a way where you had, a, you had your board and you had to like work it up from the beginning when you had a new song. Yeah. Um, and really listen to what the song needs instead of just like relying on a template um, which might force a song into some, you know, a sound that it was not really meant for it, but, yeah. but you're you're doing it out of sort of habit. Maybe. Yeah, and especially a lot of people are uh, are, are especially newer bands are um, sort of coming up in the business uh, with the mentality to just fix it in post, you know. Uh, and, yeah. And and you can tell that uh, the the roadside albums and and selling home. The, the the mic decision in was was done in such a way that the drums sound more natural that, than they yeah. would have otherwise been and you know what I mean uh, and, yeah and I think that's a completely fresh approach uh, and and it's actually a throwback approach to to what you were saying to the seventies production uh, yeah I guess in a way we did what they had to do back then as well because like. Coming out of the '60s, where I mean, if you if you read about the Beatles um, and the, the later productions that they did, um, I think Abbey Road is like the, one of the most marvelous productions. I have. That sort of dry and intimate, warm sound. Um, but the way of getting there was just like trial and error, basically. Yeah. Because until they recorded Revolver, when they recorded in that studio, it was made after a manual. They had the engineers had white lab coats and there was exact positions for the microphones for yeah. the drums and, and that was how you were supposed to do it. But they were just the pop bands and no one really cared. So they they started like trying different things like putting the, the mics closer to the drums, yeah. which is now the standard in recording drums. Yeah. I mean, no one would ever thinking about having the, the bass drum mic like one meter away from the bass drum. Yeah. Like. Um, and I just came to the to the point where I I felt that modern productions were not doing anything for me. I I heard good music, and it it did nothing for me, and you know in the guts. Yeah. And I started realizing that whenever I listened to mid '70s music, um, something happened, and I could feel the music in a different way. It came out, and it felt so much more alive and aggressive and uh, dynamic. No. Uh, even though, I mean, you can really hear that it's very hard, you know, there's hard compression going on, but, but it's more like a compression of the entire, you know, the entire mix yeah, rather than everything being overly compressed to yeah. sound even, you know? Yeah. 
um, and I'm not trying to do that. So we we spent two days. Just because I, I, I love the drum sound of, of many of the mid '70s recordings, um, the expensive ones, uh, they're, they're just like incomparable. I, there's nothing today that matches that still. Um, but I had no idea, you know. I, I, I of course I knew that. Okay, we we don't have the equipment that they had in our rehearsing room. Yeah. Uh, there's no way we can we can have like a a, a big desk with with uh, with the needs. Um, preamps and yeah. compressors so we'll have to sort of find and, and improvise a way of, of getting somewhere close to that with digital means yeah spending two days me and, and, and a friend from uh, southern sweden just trying different different drum heads different ways of, of dampening the drum heads with different kinds of fabric different kinds of tape different kinds of moon gel uh, different mic positions and it's different tunings and it, it just took like forever uh, until we sort of found something that's okay this now it starts to to, to be what i want to have you know? yeah oh i'm i'm uh late for my next interview actually. yeah 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 no, let's, uh, actually, let's do an, one final important question yeah yeah for sure actually this one is uh focused um in on on our uh spain audience uh, you guys did a, a festival in Barcelona um, called Deep Prague, my friend. Um, and it was yeah. a, com- a completely prog festival, you know, Anathema, Opus, uh, Fish. Um, w- yeah. What was that like? And what do you think? Uh, do you think a 100% prog festival has a future in this day and age? Um, I, I think that I, I appreciate both the very chiseled out festivals and the very wide festivals uh both of them are very important um i guess i'm a bit bipolar there but the the middle section is not that interesting i I want it to be either like extremely chiseled out uh or totally like a a wide range of of different music styles because the 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 point of the chiseled out one is that if you like that music you can you can get the top notch of that specific music yeah. and you're likely to find maybe one or two more bands in that specific music style yeah but the even more important thing i guess is to have those wide range festivals where you mix it up and preferably even i mean like not not making a, a prog stage and a rock stage and a pop stage because then people will just go to whatever they think yeah. is good um, I think especially in this time of day when the music industry has changed so much and the way we receive music has changed so much, um, it is, ironically enough, less likely that you're exposed to music that you wouldn't expect yeah. today than it was 20 years ago. Yeah. But there is a bigger flow and there's so many more possibilities, but the possibilities demand that you actually take that choice you make that choice yourself and take that yeah. direction to find that music so there's a much bigger possibility for people nowadays only to listen to what they feel comfortable with yeah um and the mainstream media has become even more product oriented and yeah. and, and less passion driven so uh, i think it's more important now than ever to have mixed festivals where you expose people to good music and they might find something that they had no idea that they would like yeah well thank you very much for your time daniel and uh i hope uh, the next interviewer uh, is not too upset (laughs) and i I wish you the very best of luck Uh, i think your your guys are not touring uh, anymore for uh, falling home because you you Uh, well we're we're thinking about maybe uh making one more stretch next year because there seems to be a a high demand for for a few more shows of that type we're, we're looking into it we'll see what happens we have a few interesting surprises for the fans next year okay so we'll see what happens awesome well thank you very much daniel and uh very best of luck with your health and obviously uh with the band and with the release of home of uh falling home thank you very much have a nice day yeah you too. nice talking to you yeah you too bye-bye all right bye